Good morning and welcome to another edition of Our Town here on 94.9 and 99.1 The River. My name is Darren Swenson. Our Town, as always, brought to you by Decora Bank and Trust. On the program this morning, we will have our monthly check-in with Decorah School Superintendent Tim Cronin. We'll check in with Blake Moen uh, with the Decorah Parks and Recreation Department. The registration for summer programs will begin next Monday. First things first, this morning we'll get an update on the flooding situation along the Mississippi River in Alamakee County. We'll check in with Corey Snitker from Alamakee County Emergency Management. That's our first conversation this morning on our town uh, right here. On 94.9 and 99.1 The River, it's brought to you by Decora Bank and Trust. Getting an update on the flooding situation along the Mississippi River with Alamakee County Emergency Management Coordinator Corey Snitker. And for timing purposes, we'll tell you we're having this conversation at about 4 o'clock on Wednesday afternoon. And Corey, what is the latest uh, regarding uh, the situation uh, along the Mississippi uh, in your county right now? Uh, right now, actually, things are looking a little bit better as far as how high the river is going to crest. Uh, they've been decreasing a little bit uh, uh, every couple of days, uh, which has been helped a lot by the fact we've had no rain really upriver. So that's been aiding in that process there. Right now, they're expecting Lansing to be right around uh, potentially uh, 19, about 20 feet at the most. But uh, And then Har uh, Harper's Ferry, which goes off the McGregor uh, gauge, is looking at about 23.7. So, again, these are slowly coming down, and Lansing should hopefully crest here in the next day or two, and then Harper's Ferry should be cresting here probably by Friday in this weekend. So, And when you uh, talk about the uh, river level in Lansing, what does 19 feet mean if you're just looking at the river? Uh, what does that affect in Lansing? Uh, basically, what that is is uh, – Right now, it's kind of all the effects have basically kind of been taking place as people are aware the, the the bridge is closed at Black Hawk Bridge there in Lansing. So that's because of the water reaching the Wisconsin side of the Dyke Road. Um, the city is kind of we're already seeing most of the minor imp the impacts taking place in Lansing itself as far as flooding on Front Street, which was an expectation flooding over the ball diamond, some of their back areas there. And we've been working very closely with the city's uh, wastewater management team to get them some extra pumps and things like that. So we'll see some more effects, but they should just, uh, most of them that are taking place are taking place now. And with a smaller amount of levels that they're expecting should be manageable by what they have on hand. Within Harper's Ferry, uh, basically all the mitigation actions have basically been taken care of. There are some people who are watching the, the levels of the river to see if they got up to their houses, which right now looks like those who have not had the sandbag around their own house probably do not, do not need to. And those that have basically are prepared at this point in a sense. So we're kind of most of the mitigation actions that need to be taking place have taken place throughout our county. So that's a good thing that people are just kind of wait and see now to see actually how high the river gets and then how long this crest and down, you know, down flooding will take. And I know uh, you never want to deal with these situations, but it's a reality of life that you have to. Is there is maybe a good thing about dealing with the flooding situation? Uh, is that the fact that it does give you some time to put these mitigation efforts into place? Yeah, we're actually, uh, and you're, you bring up a really good point. Uh, you know, the Mississippi floods annually. Every spring it floods. And so we as a county are very blessed in the sense that our residents and businesses that are along the Mississippi, they're used to this. This is not their first rodeo in a sense. Uh, they know what to do and they, they basically watch the river gauges because they're used to it on an annual basis. So they start taking action as they see the water rising and looking at the potential crest. And so it makes my job a lot easier because, you know, people are already doing what they need to do. Uh, really, what I've been able to focus on is providing assistance specifically to the cities and, and to the local as they hear from their local residents that, hey, we may need this or we need that. So that allows me to focus more on providing aid to the cities and getting them what they need to have uh, as far as like especially getting some sandbags made down in Harper's Ferry. We've made over 1,600 sandbags down there for the local residents to use. And it, we're happy to see that the majority of them have been used or in place and stuff. So again, uh, with this being an annual basis, a lot of people already know what to do. They've got a plan. They know where to go. Uh, so we don't have to worry about finding them housing or anything like that. Those who do live along the river, obviously we have a lot of recreational vacation homes there that, you know, are not occupied during the, uh, during the wintertime or during, they can just, you know, they can stay at home or they've already got planned to have a place to stay. So it really makes our response a lot easier compared to maybe some other counties where they're having actual 
metro or uh, urban areas being, you know, potentially under flood risk. And when you uh, look at the situation, you mentioned uh, Mississippi uh, flooding happens year in and year out, but you're going to have a near record crest uh, in a situation like this. What type of challenges does that present this specific year that you uh, normally don't have to deal with on a year in and year out basis? Yeah, right now, uh, the, the obviously the, the historic crest is 1965. That's kind of the, the bar in the sand that everybody works off of. Uh, 2001 was the next crest. And that's actually what we're looking at in 2001. Yeah, I really regard it from the standpoint that 1965 was a long time ago. The river is not the same river it was in 65, nor is it really the same river it was in 2001. So what we're also looking at is the impacts that are that are annotated on these flood guides as far as this is what happens at this level. We can reevaluate those, make sure they're accurate or add new flood impact levels on there so that we can look at these river rises and know when to react and when to prepare to react. So it's like anything else. You look at every disaster as a learning opportunity and that's an opportunity to improve your planning process and specifically with these flood impacts to make sure they're accurate and that they reflect the things that may or may not happen at those points so that we can do the right things ahead of time. What could change as of right now? And I understand that's probably a loaded question. I think right now I'm talking to the weather service again with us being so close to cresting um, that probably there's not going to be a big change per se. I, I know there's rain coming in the forecast the end of this week. And so basically what we're being told by the weather or the hydrology team at the National Weather Service is that even with there's heavy rain, which they're not expecting super heavy rains up in Minnesota and Wisconsin, that water is going to take a while to get down here. What we're really looking at potentially with a lot of rain coming in is an extended flood season versus a higher crest. It's just going to take a lot longer for all this flooding to go away in a sense. And then we might see little spikes in, you know, it'll start to go down, come back up again with the rainstorm up north. And you just have to deal with that. You know, obviously, we'd like to get the flooding done over with, get back to normal on these river towns. But unfortunately, with the amount of water and with any incoming rains, that can make this a long flood season. You touched on uh, the roads that are closed, the Blackhawk Bridge uh, that is uh, closed uh, over from Lansing to DeSoto. How important is it uh, to give a reminder to folks to... There's a, re there's a reason those barricades are there and you need to stay away from them. Uh, how important is it for uh, folks to just uh, steer clear of that area and uh, let Mother Nature uh, do its thing? Yeah, I can't stress enough, uh, especially when you consider the road there across the dike going to Wisconsin. That's, on a, that's coming off the main channel. There's a lot of strong water moving there. And it is actually flooding is one of the major causes of deaths and natural disasters in the United States. Because oftentimes we underestimate the power of water. It doesn't take a lot of water to knock you off your feet, nor does it take a lot of water to take a vehicle off of its wheelbase in, in heavy currents, especially in that area there where we know there's some very strong currents going underneath those bridges, and things like that. So trying to get around those barricades and trying to go down the road puts a lot of people, you know, obviously the person who's driving, but also any rescuers that need to come out. So we can't stress enough. The roads are closed for a reason because it's just not safe. And the last thing we want to see is someone ending up in the river and then having to go out and rescue them and putting other people's lives in jeopardy. What are the main things that people need to keep in mind as of this time? Uh, obviously, just being safe. If they're going to check their property, obviously, they realize that the river is the river. It's got current, you know, may look good on the surface, but just to be, you know, again, really need to stay, you know, again, people should be staying off the river in boats, obviously, just because of the amount of debris that's out there, the amount of current. Obviously, we want to avoid creating wakes that would cause damage to houses that are not getting those little waves coming over. They're potentially against their walls or if they got a flood wall built. You know, just being safe and just giving time for the, the, the flooding waters to recede. So that if they need to go and check the property, they can do it from dry ground or from a boat that's not going to be caught up in some debris or some channel or causing damage to other properties that because of, of wake or things like that. So just and most people know that they're generally, you know, understand the safety. We just want to make sure that we stress that again, we don't want to see people ending up in the river, uh, you know, and potentially having, you know, again, obviously don't want anybody to drown and putting other pe people in danger because we need to do you know, rescue operations. Anything else uh, we're missing? Anything else you want to pass on as long as you got the forum? Yeah, I'd like to say a, a great big thank you to a lot of people at this point that have helped out. I'll kind of go with my little cheat list I created. <laughs> Obviously, uh, Winnesheet County Emergency Management uh, provided us uh, their uh, sandbagging machine, which is a uh, out, of, uh, out of their location, which... Uh, we utilize in Harpers Ferry and with a uh, small, uh, in a short period of time, we are able, again, to create over 1,500 sandbags for local residents to use. 
I'd like to thank the Frankville Fire Department, who, which aided us in utilizing that machine. Obviously, the sheriff and I have been working very closely. Uh, he's He worked a really, you know, doing a lot of work with the sandbag and himself. Uh, the city governments in Harpers Ferry and, and uh, Lansing, especially, since they are the most impacted cities, been working closely with the mayors and with the city clerks and with their representatives. And, you know, the Harpers Ferry Fire Department was out there helping the sandbag and all the volunteers that came out. I really appreciate that. We've got a great, great group of people here in this county who want to help and provide assistance. And also just want to say uh, the National Weather Service and La Crosse is doing a great job of giving us month, our daily updates of the flood outlook. So, again, just want to say thanks to all those people. If I forgot somebody, I apologize, but a great group of people here in the county and the surrounding region to work with. So. All right, uh, Corey, we thank you and uh, all those people who you just listed for everything they're doing to keep uh, people as safe and, uh, and properties as safe as possible. I'm sure we'll be checking in with you in the next uh, day or two, and uh, hopefully uh, this can be put behind us uh, here uh, three, four days down the road. Yeah, it'd be nice, again, to get through the crest and, and actually start seeing uh, you know, where we're going to be at and how long this flood is going to take so people can, again, get back to life and get the river back to where people can utilize it safely. Corey Snitker from Alma Key County Emergency Management. Well, the summer will get here eventually. I know like a week and a half ago, we had six inches of snow in our area, but the summer will get here eventually. Blake Moen has guaranteed me that. And he's here to talk about uh, programs related to the Decora Parks and Recreation uh, Department. And summer registration is uh, right uh, around the corner from what I understand, Blake. Is that correct? Yep, yep. No, thanks for having us, Darren. As always, really appreciate everything you do for uh, Northeast Iowa and, and um, everything you do. So, um, yeah, registration is right around the corner. It will be open up on Monday, May 1st at 8 a.m. So that will be available for all people to register online or in our office on, again, Monday, May 1st at 8 a.m. Right now, folks can go onto our Facebook pages and our uh, website as well to see the offerings that we have coming up for this summer. So parents can take this week to plan ahead, look at what's going to be offered, um, and again, just kind of get a head start on, on maybe what are some of the programs that are going to work in your summer schedule. And then, as I said, registration opens next Monday. Yeah, and the nice thing about the schedule you got uh, out online, uh, not only does it offer what you have, it offers when you have, because balancing a schedule uh, with families, being busy, and this and that going on, uh, that's as important as anything. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, shoot, I'm a young young parent myself, but I'm already with two little boys figuring that out, that, yeah, scheduling is everything. And, and that's something that we started a handful of years ago with – the week before registration opens of laying out the dates, the times, uh, the locations of all of our programs. And Darren, that includes everything from swimming lessons to pool information to when Little League is going to be this summer, softball, um, all of our peewee and talk camps that we put on, and other programs that are also coming up in our department. So um, we try to run that brochure that comes out on, on Monday that will essentially run for programs that will be starting in late May through June and through July as well. So um, we're looking forward to being able for parents to take a look at what we're offering. And uh, is uh, there a registration uh, for uh, pool passes uh, starting or is that already underway? Yep, yep. So registration for pool passes will start on May 1st as well. Okay. Um, one note I do want to make on the pool passes, Darren, is last year was our first year of implementing the key card system where when people purchase a pool pass, they get a key card that has a QR code on there that they use to scan when they come into the pool. One announcement we do want to make about those codes is that if residents have the email, the text message, or the physical QR code pass that they had from last summer, they can use that same exact code for this year. They have to buy the new pass, so it'll still be a cost to purchase the pass, but the actual code itself can be renewed this year. Um, that was one thing that we encourage a lot of people to do at the end of the summer was to hang on to that physical pass because um, that can be used for this year. So that way you don't have to be issued a brand new QR code. So either way, if you lost it, um, of course, last summer was a long time ago. So if you did lose it, we can replace that for you here in the office. But um, if you happen to have last year's, it can be renewed after you make your pool pass purchase. Reuse and recycle. Can't go wrong with that, right? 
Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, it was a big reason why we wanted to go towards that past system. You know, years and years ago, it was a lot of uh, laminating cards with names on the back. But this year and our kind of future outlook of passes is we're hoping that this will be turned more into a reuse type situation that people can purchase a pass. And if you hang on to it for a handful of years, then that can be your same physical pass every year. And I know as we talk about summer programs and the pool uh, coming up, I uh, had a conversation with uh, Andy Nimrod about a month ago that some of the costs uh, are going up this year with some budget situations that the city was dealing with. But any families that uh, perhaps uh, are a little concerned about that, uh, I understand there's an option uh, that they can explore uh, with the Judy Severson Everyone uh, Plays Award or or a grant, I should say. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Darren. No, I appreciate you bringing it up. Uh, Judy Severson, as I'm sure everyone knows, but for those that don't, uh, was long, long time. I, I call her a Park Rec Hall of Famer. Uh, if there right. is a Park Rec Hall of Fame, Judy Severson was had worked in the Park Rec office from the 70s up until I started a couple of years ago. Everything from the administrative side of things to helping with programs to pretty much everything. And when she retired, we um, one of the things that the department did was start this scholarship fund underneath her name. And what it is, is that, as you said, Darren, it's the Everyone Plays Judy Severson Scholarship. For parents that are looking at uh, registration on our website and seeing the price and costs that are listed on there, um, if you do have uh, want to look at some options as far as affordability and looking to get into whether it's light, little league swimming passes lessons, whatever it may be. Um, we do have options. We do have options for you to um, look into that. Contact our office and let's have a conversation about it. That's what that fund is for, for Judy Severson Foundation. Um, that is an option for folks to look into as well. I do know as well on the pool pass ends that Iowa Community Action is also another great place that has worked with families for years and years and years on purchasing pool passes through them, but we also work hand in hand with Iowa Community Action on the pool pass and specifically. So that is another option for people looking at, at the increased cost, but affordability for this summer. Are there any registration deadlines for uh, the pool or for any of the programs? Yeah, that's a great. I'm glad you brought it up too, Darren. One important deadline that we want to share is that there is an early bird registration for pool passes. So there is a little bit of a discounted cost that runs up until May 26th. So when we open registration until May 26th, after that date, um, they'll, those first few weeks of May are early bird specials that you can purchase passes at a discounted rate. After that, the rate just increases by a little bit, but something that people can take advantage of there. Also on May 26th is when a lot of our big programs uh, registration deadline is, which include Little League, T-ball, softball, and so on and so forth. And we do that, Darren, because we have to accommodate for t-shirt orders and teams and that organization piece there. Otherwise, a lot of our camps and whatnot, registration deadlines don't run, don't really end until June, but we do encourage parents that don't take a deadline for granted because um, it is a first come first serve for programs that we are offering. So it's really, really important to, um, you know, take a look at that May 1st date, see what's going to work for you. And um, probably wouldn't be in our best interest to recommend that you wait until the last second to sign up. I would take advantage of it when it opens. And from what I understand, uh, you've done a lot of work in uh, Decorah City Parks over the last four years after receiving an Iowa Great Places grant about uh, four years ago, uh, and you're going to celebrate that this summer. Yeah, yeah, we are, Darren. No, we're really excited about this, and one thing I definitely want to highlight with um, having us on today, so uh, that, as you said, Darren, back in 2019, the Iowa Parks and Recreation Department received the Iowa Great Places grant, which was essentially a grant that we worked hard to get that would help restore especially historic rock structure features that are in our parks. Um, some of these projects include the wall along Park Street and Phelps Park, some of the Park uh, Phelps trails that we've implemented over the past few years that come off of the park shop, as well as um, going down to Doug Road. There's been a lot of work at Dunning Springs, which includes some of the new pillars, bridge, a new entrance to Dunning Springs, um, a new trail and sitting area at Pulpit Rock for folks, as well as folks that have been on Ice Cave, you've noticed that there are a steps project that is being finished this summer. 
all of that um, work that we were able to do was because of the Iowa Great Places grant. And so as a celebration, as we finish up work this summer, um, during the month of July, uh, which will be the week foc focusing on the weekend of July 8th and 9th, we will be doing a fam fun family-oriented week weekend with a chance for us to celebrate these new amenities in our parks. Um, we already, of course, I'm biased, but we already have a tremendous park system. But over the past handful of years, being able to celebrate these amenities is going to be just adding to not only what we have, but adding to it. So um, on the weekend of July 8th and 9th, we'll be doing... As I said, some different activities, some fun events, and doing some different activities. They'll be showcasing the parks that families can come out for, community members can come out for, and whatnot as well. Um, we are still finalizing details and times and what that will look like and, and some of the other details with the events of that weekend. However, I would encourage folks to uh, be on the lookout on our Facebook page as well as our website for an announcement about what the specific events will be as we iron out some of those details as well. Uh, one last thing I do want to mention about that month is that it is also National Parks and Recreation Month, and so all, that's why we thought it'd be a great uh, opportunity to to replicate what is going to be happening in that weekend. We also, though, are going to be celebrating some of the new shelters that we have implemented over the past few years in our parks, which include the Gesme Shelter in Phelps Park, the Fossum Shelter at Wayside Park, as well as all the facility improvements that have been going on at Mary Christopher Park, which is like the shelter and the playground area. We really want to highlight those as well. So be looking for more information that will be coming here, um, hopefully in the next few weeks and into June. But we're really excited to be able to have a weekend to celebrate all those amenities. Gives me another reason to uh, chat with you here in about a month or uh, so. Uh, Blake, anything else you got uh, up your sleeve besides the big muscles this morning? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that, Darren. I don't know about that. But uh, no, just want to encourage people hey, to keep, keep track of um, our Facebook pages and social media. Um, we've we've um, been able to do some really great things on social media. So keep up to date on that, as well as just a reminder to folks that when you're registering for programs, you can register with a credit card online. When you come into the office, we do only accept cash or checks. So you can register either way, whether you're online or coming in, but just keep a note of that when you are coming into the Park Rec office. Otherwise, Darren, we're getting close to finishing our spring programs, including our biggest program every year, which is soccer. I'm happy to announce we have over 400 kids signed up for soccer in that program right now um, that come from all over Northeast Iowa. And we have over 70 volunteer coaches that are helping the teams. And I, I just want to give a big shout out to that, to those parents that are stepping up and helping us out because there is no way uh, uh, my colleague Mallory and I would be able to uh, juggle 400 kids, just us two on Saturday mornings for soccer. So it's because of the parents we're able to do it. So a great big shout out to them and thank you for everything. And we're looking forward to summer. All right, uh, Blake, appreciate the uh, time and the update on everything going on with the Decorah Parks and Recreation Department. Always a pleasure to talk to you and we'll chat soon. Awesome, Darren. Thanks again for having us and for everything you do. We appreciate it. Blake Mullen from the Decorah Parks and Recreation Department. Having our monthly conversation with Decorah School Superintendent Tim Cronin. And Tim, I got to get something out of the way first. Uh, going back to our last conversation in March, I believe I made the statement that I didn't believe you would have any snow days beyond that point. Yeah. Obviously, I jinxed you, so I'll apologize to you, and I'll take the thank yous from uh, any students in the district. Let's get that out of the way first. Uh, yeah, I think that the thank yous would probably be coming from the seniors <laughs> that uh, would have a snow day that they wouldn't have to make up. Um, I, I hope you're aware that the non-thank yous might come from the students and staff that now have a final day of June 2nd, Friday, June 2nd. So that might not be a day you want to drive around and own that jinx as much as you are today. All right. I just wanted to get that out of the way uh, first before we move forward. Since, yeah, I appreciate you know, that. It's been kind of an interesting year on that end of things. Uh, at your uh, meeting a little over a week ago, uh, you got done uh, with the budget uh, for 2023-2024. Uh, 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 how was that process perhaps uh, maybe a little different this year than years past? Uh, so uh, building budgets, is it's kind of, it's it's, 
in my 10 years of being a superintendent, that has really been automated and improved greatly. Uh, lots of stuff is set by, set by the state or or there's a fixed amount that we're allowed to levy for as a district. So building a budget, um, um, and, and it's more, more more what we approve. We approve the budget, but we approve the uh, levies, and the, uh, which ultimately feeds into the tax rate. Um, there's not as much uh, flexibility in that process as one might think. Um, certainly here, uh, what was interesting, we're, we're getting to the end of our debt service payments, which is um, basically our mortgage payments for our high school. And uh, it was designed, the payments were designed to tear down the last two years. Um, and I'd love to say, well, I've never seen that before, but I've only been in two other districts. So maybe that's a common thing. Usually the last year payment is kind of the one that tears down, but we tear down in, in two different uh, uh, years. Um, we kind of offset that by uh, funding our management levy, which was a little bit, uh, we wanted to make sure that that money had uh, funds in it, which we can either use Management fund is used for uh, uh, insurance and uh, not health insurance, but district insurance and contracts. So there's that, that having a little bit money, more money there would give us the flexibility to enter into like a natural gas contract in the future. Um, and it's possible that the state legislature will change a few things and add teacher recruitment or retention as appropriate uses of that fund. So. So when you asked me what was different, uh, I guess having a debt service that teared down and was one of the big differences this year, we got done with our budget and then the state did do a few things with property taxes, which then required us to adjust the process and go back in. Not not huge adjustments, but just little tweaks with the adjustments. Um, and so, uh, but, uh, you know, Kathy's been doing this for a long time. And then I guess what I was alluding to at the beginning, uh, when I first started it, it was a huge Excel document that you would work on and you would go to websites and you would look up and you would key in and there was uh, human error. Uh, we've got a new uh, finance director, Jonathan Parker, and he's got it an interactive web-based uh, solution. So from the as, from the perspective of, of doing a, a budget and levy from a, a school business official and superintendent, it's a lot more automated. Instead of going to a website and grabbing the number, the website does that for you. So uh, Jonathan Parker came in and it's been awesome with regards to that. It makes it a lot easier. And I know you're limited to uh, what you can spend in certain levies and perhaps uh, maybe that'll get tweaked a little bit uh, here in the next couple of weeks, but would you like to have more freedom uh, with levies or is this process an okay one in your mind? Well, that's kind of, that's a, like, uh, that's a good question. Yeah. I, if we could have a little bit more flexibility with our levies, uh, uh, that would be uh, helpful for sure. Um, I, you know, some of them I wouldn't want, you know, you can only put so much into debt service because that's your mortgage payment. You know, you don't want to, you obviously you have to put in a minimum amount. Um, there are opportunities or pre-levy for that. Uh, maybe for instructional support, if we could put more into that, then we'd have a little bit more general fund. Uh, we'd have to tax at a higher rate, but that would probably be, that would probably be a way that you could give uh, local districts the opportunity to uh, fund their schools at a little bit different rate. So um, I would say as uh, Superintendent Decor, that would probably benefit us. I think in general, our community supports education well, and I think uh, you could make a case for that. So uh, if you could change that tomorrow, let me know. Um, but yeah, there'd be some opportunities that if we had a little bit more authority over our our taxing base that would benefit to Cora but but I also know that the funding formula in Iowa is set up so that schools for the most part uh whether you're in Decora Iowa or Waterloo Iowa or uh Charter Oak you're you're funded at the same level student wise when it comes to that funding formula at the state level the I believe that formula is older than I am and I'm not that young anymore would you like to see that formula look, looked at to uh, maybe catch up to 2023, or is it one of those cases of it isn't broke, so let's not fix it? Well, I, it might be a case where it's not, not it might be a little broke, but the solution might be worse than what we have now. Uh, I, uh, we've, got a, we've got a pretty complex funding formula. Uh, 
as I recall, was coming about, uh, I think the most recent version was being redone in the 80s. But the idea is that every student goes, brings the same amount of dollars to the schoolhouse door was kind of the idea. And in some places where you're property rich, um, you get less state funding and other places uh, it makes up for that. So it probably helps a state like Iowa, where we do have uh, regions that aren't densely populated and we want to have schools in those regions because we know that for the welfare of the state, that it's it's good that everybody has a quality public education. So um, does it work exactly the way I want it to work? No. Do I have a better solution? No. So you just have to be careful. Sometimes the the fix is worse than the problem. And related to uh, the uh, budget uh, in a little bit of a way, uh, you did prove the agreement uh, with the uh, DEA at uh, your last meeting on the issuance of contracts uh, for next year. Obviously, that's uh, something that uh, you need to get done every year, and you got it done. Uh, was that was there any uh, bumps in the road on that process? No, that was a really nice process. I uh, uh, working with the DEA that can uh, that can be a um, you know that's just a tough tough thing because you've got uh, you know the people we count on the most are our teachers. Uh, we certainly want to compensate them and and treat them with respect, and we also have to understand that we've got limited resources, so we can't just give them everything. So that's just kind of a, you have to be, that's a careful process. And uh, it's kind of like arbitration in baseball. They, uh, you know, uh, uh, they talk about that process where you go into baseball arbitration and the ownership says what a crummy year you had. And then the player hears what the ownership thinks about him while they're just doing that to maybe drive salaries down. I would say that that might have been in the old model um, of negotiations where it was kind of a, hey, we're not going to spend money uh, on teachers and teachers saying you have to spend more money on us. It's really a more of a collaborative process right now. And that's driven a lot by uh, districts. And, you know, there's more of an understanding from uh, district administration, but also from uh, teacher association that we're all on the same team and we're all working. You know, They know that we want to pay them uh, more money and we want to be competitive. So that really helps immensely. But I, I've noticed a shift in my superintendent meetings uh, where it might've been almost a competition to have lower settlements, to be more fiscally responsible to I'm going to meetings and people are, you know, saying, Hey, we settled at 4% and uh, you know, people kind of understanding that that's, that's how it is in education right now. We uh, there, this, this is kind of a manifestation of the teacher shortage and knowing that we have to pay people more and, and have to get more competitive with salaries. But with the process here, it was it was a it was a very nice process. Um, appreciated working with the DEA. We we really talked uh, and understood. And, and honestly, their initial offer uh, was a reasonable initial offer. Our our board really extended themselves. Uh, you know, in, in my first experience was teachers would come in at nine to 10 percent and the board would offer zero percent and you'd end up at three percent. And that's how it was in Cedar Rapids and Central City and and, and my start. Um, teachers came in at about four point nine. District came in at four point one. Uh, and so when we got down to the negotiations, it didn't take very long. And, and we settled at the four point three seven. So, um, yeah. Good process. Of course, a little over a month from now, uh, summer uh, will start as you'll uh, leave uh, the classroom on June 2nd. Uh, from a project perspective, how busy is the district going to be this summer? Well, uh, we've got a few things going on uh, between before summer starts. We, we uh, previously approved the baseball lighting project, and so that should be going in earnest. Uh, we've got a lot of smaller projects kind of uh, here and there in the district, I think the bigger, the biggest thing that we're working on getting bids for and getting completed is the outdoor play area that is right across the street from me currently at uh, Cary Lee. Uh, there's like a little grass area and it's between Cary Lee and the middle school it gets used extensively by students and uh, uh, gets very muddy and grass doesn't grow. So the board had approved with use of a combination of Esser and Pebble funds that we're going to do an outdoor play area that uh, is uh, artificial. And so we're working on getting that done. That's probably the, the one of the, the bigger projects that we'll have going on that people will notice. Um, and that will be a nice little addition for the whole community and, and being able to have a, a space that you can go on, whether, you know, whether it's raining or not will be super nice for both of those schools. I, I know most people know what Pebble funds are. What are Esser funds? 
Oh, Esser, that's that that's the last little bit of the uh, COVID relief funds from the state or from the federal government. And so uh, district started this year with about six hundred and uh, let's say six hundred and thirty thousand dollars. And we've uh, used a little bit on on some positions, but you don't want to put too many positions in that because then when they go away, you don't have those position, you don't have the funding for those positions. So we've tried to do some projects. We've done some air uh, exchange projects that, uh, uh, was nice to be able to fund through that. And, uh, um, so we had, uh, outdoor play area being important because if you can't go outside then you're cooped inside all day. So we did get prior approval for our outdoor, um, play space from the state. And so that's how that project kind of came down. I know so, when you... Go ahead. Yeah. Esther just would stand for like, uh, uh, the, Secondary Recovery Act. Uh, I, I'm education. I shouldn't even have tried to figure out what the acronym is. So let's skip it and go on. All right. Well, you explained what it is without the yeah. acronym, and we'll let you slide on that end of things. We'll give you, we'll give you a B plus for okay. Okay. Uh, I know over the last uh, decade or so, uh, there's been incentives for school district to share certain positions, and it looks like you're going to be uh, sharing a social worker with the Howard Winnipeg School District. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, uh, Howard Wynn has to approve that with their board, but uh, um, that's our plan. Um, yeah, so understanding how operational sharing works, it's um, it's a pretty interesting incentive from the state where um one district has a position, whether they hire new or they have an existing person, and they share up to 20%, so one day a week with another district. And uh, if they're one of the one of the specific positions, so uh, of course we're being, so like examples might be superintendent is a sharing position, HR, school business official, buildings and grounds, uh, counselor, social worker, um, I'm missing a couple. Uh, transportation. These are all positions that can be shared across district. Uh, we will then uh, do something called, uh, every year we do a, a staff report. It's called fall bid staff for the state. And you just indicate in there, hey, this is a shared position. It qualifies for operational sharing. And when we get our budget in, I guess, February of 24, there'll be a little line that will add in extra students that didn't attend here, but the state gives us credit for having more students because we shared. Um, right now, the state will uh, increase our enrollment by two students for sharing a social worker. There's currently a bill that would take that back up to three students. And so um, I, the whole point on sharing is then it, it, the state, there's an incentive where, where the state gives you extra money. So they're gonna at least give us $15,000 to share a school so, social worker on top of the fact that um, we think our cost might be about for three days a week of a social worker about thirty-two thousand dollars, and then if if the state gives us fifteen thousand dollars, all of a sudden we've cut down our costs and made it real affordable to have three days a week a social worker. Same thing for Howard Wynn; they can get a social worker for about twenty-one thousand dollars. If the state funds it at two students, fifteen thousand, they've got two days a week for you know roughly six thousand dollars. So. So it's a nice incentive uh, from the state and gets used a lot more with smaller districts, but I did a little analysis of districts our size uh, with some of the data from Iowa Association of School Boards and roughly uh, the 10 districts bigger than, larger than Decorah and the 10 districts smaller, they shared about uh, six positions. And so six times um, 7,500, you know, that would generate roughly $45,000 for that district. And that's what I got on my math too. So Okay. Well, I didn't, I, I just was doing that mental, but sure. I, I, I had a piece of paper in front of me, so I was cheating, but uh, there you go. we move on. Uh, anything new to report on the elementary school facility discussion? No, uh, but I appreciate you asking. Cause I, we haven't had, we're, we continue in talks. Our, our big things are finding a, uh, locations, permanent locations for tennis and permanent locations for softball. Um, and once those happen, then we would work in earnest to get drawings of where the building will actually be built, would be built. Um, if we don't have permanent locations for that, we don't obviously want to do a drawing on land that is owned by the city. Those negotiations talks are 
are happening with Travis from the city and other uh, places. I don't want to get too specific because among other things, if I say, yeah, we're looking at uh, buying this land or that land, or we, you know, we've got negotiation that might uh, in, uh, make our uh, negotiation stance difficult. So we do keep some of that stuff secret until we're ready to make an offer on property. But Anything? we're continuing and we, we, we're not moving at the best pace, but that doesn't mean that we're not working to get some solutions. Anything else uh, you want to pass on to uh, district patrons as long as you got the forum? Boy, uh, other than, you know, busy time of year with activities and we, uh, you know, we start to recognize retirees next week. Uh, we'll have a, a in-house dinner for retirees and, and folks that have met a milestone which is nice too, you know, uh, you do the five-year increments. And then after that, we're going to recognize our seniors and our scholarship nights. And pretty soon it'll be graduation and uh, it'll be ready for summer. So just kind of a busy time, but lots of opportunities between uh, lots of activities this spring still to get to. Um, we just had the sixth grade play. Wizard of Oz was was uh, one of the highlights a couple of weeks ago, um, but we've got uh, our concerts i want to say the orchestra is coming up in a week or two um as well as it's full full board ahead right now for i guess soccer tennis golf and track all right uh tim we appreciate you uh, taking some time to tell us what's going on in the district like you do uh each in every month uh thanks for the time as always and we'll look forward to having a conversation with me and if there's any snow days in may don't blame them on me <laughs> fair enough sounds All right. good alrighty Tim Cronin from the Decorah Community School District hey, thank you to our guest on the program this morning Corey Snitker from Ella McKee County Emergency Management updating us on what is going on with the flooding situation along the Mississippi River Blake Mullen from the Decorah Parks and Recreation Department in or a school superintendent, Tim Cronin. Don't forget, we put these shows on YouTube each and every week. We realize you can't always be near a streaming device or a radio around 9 a.m. on a Thursday morning. But we want to uh, get you this information because we feel, A, it's important, and B, it's uh, interesting. And we get to talk to interesting people uh, week in and week out. So if you're gallivanting out on YouTube, just go to Ford S27, Our Town Program. That's a great way to do that. And we also uh, link these on all of our Facebook pages for our LA Communications radio stations. Thanks to our sponsor, Decora Bank & Trust. Thanks to our fine guest. And most importantly, we thank you for tuning in, for logging on, or for watching Our Town on 94.9 and 99.1 The River.